Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I am proud to introduce you to Larry Hayden Wing, retired university professor, consultant, and author who built his reputation because of his comfort in telling the truth. So I can tell you for certain, sir, you are a unique person with just that introduction. <laughs> Let's just start off by discussing your career. Can you tell me just a bit about your professional journey? Well, it's long and detailed, um, but I've always been interested in the outdoors and my, my parents, uh, uh, encouraged that. Uh, in fact, they let me run a lot on my own when I was just a child. And I learned about nature on my own. Um, I was encouraged and helped by my parents by a couple of teachers in high school. And uh, I had some good mentors and some good support. And so it was not surprising that I was able to get into uh, the natural resources field. And uh, that's where I've been my whole life. Uh, I've been a wildlife biologist for 50 years. So and take me through much... the journey, Larry. I mean, really take me through the journey. So you left high school with a love for the outdoors, but where did that lead you? Well, I've worked outdoors all through high school. I trimmed trees, I planted, uh, worked for a nursery. I, I worked for contractors. I did lawns. So uh, I just was outside all the time and I, um, applied for forestry school at Iowa State and I got a scholarship. And then uh, I had worked one summer out west in Idaho. My, my stepfather was able to make some connections out there. And I lied about my age, you had to be 17, but I was 16 and he swore to it. <laughs> and I went out there and worked for the summer and came back and I, always wanted to come back to the West and I did. And so I went to the University of Idaho without a scholarship mm. and uh, got a, a bachelor's degree there, worked in the summertime for the Forest Service. I, I surveyed roads, I smoked jump, I smoked chase, I built lookout towers. Wow. I, I got real acquainted with the forest because the Forest Service in those days was a great teacher. Mm. And so when I finished, my bachelor's degree, I had enough school, you know, I, high school, bachelor's degree. I needed to go out and see the world. Well, I had to, because the Navy drafted me out. Yeah. Well, I was an ROTC, mm. so I had to go in for two and a half years and they taught me more uh, than any other single place I've ever been. Because they've been in business a long time and they know what they're doing and they, and they have good principles. Mm -hmm. and. That's part of where I learned you better tell the truth. Yes, because sir. if you lie, you've got to remember what you said. Mm -hmm. If you tell the truth, it's always the same. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did my naval duty, then uh, decided to go back and get a master's degree. And so I did that at the University of Idaho and I had good help, good people and good projects. And when I got done with that, there was an ad. They wanted somebody to go to Africa and study elephants, but you wow. had to have a had to have a PhD, and I didn't. Well, I called the guy up, and uh, he interviewed me for a whole day before he decided that I, with a master's degree, I had what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got to go to Africa for two and a half years and study elephants and wow. live, live in the forest again in a tent and. Uh, come back and then I got my PhD at the University of uh, Idaho again. You're not supposed to go to the same school, but I loved it so much and the uh, people there were so good to me that I had to do it. And I studied elk on high mountain meadows in the Idaho wilderness area for three and a half years. And I packed horses and mules and had great experiences with bears and lions and 
elk and deer and moose, and it was just heaven. And from there, I got my PhD. I went to, um, got a job at Iowa State. I was born in Iowa, so um, it, it, it's flat and it's full of tornadoes and I don't, not a great place to live forever, but my grandmother <laughs> lived there and she helped raise me. <sighs> so it gave me access to grandma, it gave me access to a great career. Iowa State's a good school. And I was there seven years. I was tenured. I became an associate professor, taught wildlife, uh, ecology, some forestry, some range. And then uh, I had an opportunity out in Wyoming. Um, they wanted me to be department head, but I got out here and said, no, I don't want to be an administrator. I want to be part of the team. I want to be a player. And so I taught at UW for one year and then I had the opportunity to go into private practice as a consultant. What led you to your passion for writing? I know about you know, your love of the outdoors, but what about writing? Well, you know, um, you have to write a thesis, you have to write a dissertation, you have to write term papers. You've got to write your way through college. And in the Navy, they have a report for everything. <laughs> so I got to where I was reasonably good at it. And that was uh, partly practice, partly natural uh, ability. And I can't take credit for that. It was just there. Mm -hmm. And I did enjoy it. And so when I got out, I was, I kept a journal in Africa, a big journal. I wrote every day. And when I left my office, and retired, I took that journal off the shelf and I got all emotional like I am now because I was gonna put that to bed. I was gonna put it on the shelf and it's gonna die. Mm. So I got to thumbing through it and I said, I've got to tell somebody these stories. Mm -hmm. So I just started to write and it just came pouring out. and. Uh, it isn't a book everybody wants. It's about elephants and, you know, not that many people uh, know about or are interested in elephants, but some people are. And the elephant book's a great book. It's, it's 450 pages. It's got mm. 300, 200 uh, color photographs in it. It weighs about 10 pounds. It's a big book. It's not just about elephants. It's about life. It's about um, chasing a mountain lion into a cave and darting it with a drug and putting a radio collar on it. It's, it's about packing horses and mules in Idaho. I, and I smoked junk when I was in college. I've done so many things that most people will never have the chance to do that I wanted to tell about it. So I know you co-edited um, a book on the North American elk. You mentioned that. So tell me yeah. some interesting facts about this creature. Here's the book. Yes, sir. Well, elk, there's about three subspecies in North America. There's the Rocky Mountain elk, the, um, the Thule elk in California, and the Roosevelt elk in Washington. And the Roosevelt elk is the biggest. A, a bull will go 900 to 1,000 pounds. Rocky Mountain elk is about 700 pounds and the Thule elk is small, it's 400 pounds. But there was a historical elk that they think is extinct, but they're not sure because there's some specimens in Arizona and New Mexico that are huge. It was, it was the biggest elk we had. And some of their antlers will weigh 40 pounds. That's a lot uh, to carry around on your head. So you know they have to be strong. Yeah. And the incredible thing is that they drop those antlers every year and grow them back the next wow. year. Wow. So they, they have to be in an environment where there's a lot of nutrition, a lot of good forage to be able to grow that much in a single year. Mm. And they're intelligent. There used to be 10 million elk in North America. There's 1 million now. Um, there used to be an Eastern variety and that's extinct now, but they were well adapted. They inhabited the forest, the grassland and everything, the desert even 
we've got a desert elk court here in Wyoming. Anyway, I've studied elk most of my professional career and they're very uh, dear to my heart. Now you've mentioned a couple of times one of my favorite animals, which is the elephant. And I know in 2012, you wrote in the footprints of elephants and that chronicled the accounts of a wildlife scientist in Uganda. So um, you gave me a little bit of the hint, but I'd love to know a little bit more about your experience compiling these accounts. I could hardly lift this thing, it's 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I saw my first um, elephant when I was in Africa um, in Kenya on safari. And it was oh. the most fascinating thing I've ever seen in my life. I was in the well, Maasai Mara and it was just amazing. That's a great place. I'm glad you got to go there. Oh, they are amazing animals. The only thing that uh, their only enemy is man. Nothing mm -hmm. else can control them. But man and poachers and um, overpopulation of people, overpopulation of elephants has made their population go way down to the point where they're on the edge of extinction or wow. being endangered. However, I'm on the advisory board of a committee that's sponsoring a project in Africa right now to study elephants. Uh, I'm too old to go out there and bash the bush, but my head still works most of the time. So we're going to study elephants on the south, outside of uh, Murchison Falls National Park in a game reserve and um, see how many we've got, what, how, what kind of habitat they're using, and work with the Uganda Game Division to help uh, increase the uh, visibility to tourists and also to hunt them, to keep them in a level where they're not destroying their habitat. Um, your most recent book, Never to Be Repeated. This one. It, right, okay, let me see that, okay. Is similarly focused on wildlife science. So I'm curious, where did the title for this book come from? And why do you think your journey was such a unique one, sir? Well, the title came from the fact that I didn't write this until I was so old that I could never repeat the things that I had described. <laughs> I don't care if you tell somebody about my book, but I can't do it anymore. So Larry, as we come to a conclusion, I've appreciated so much you sharing with us some of your work abroad as a wildlife research professional, but what's the one thing you'd like the viewer of this video feature to walk away with, sir? Well, don't be afraid to pursue what you want to do and be. Mm -hmm. And if um, you don't succeed immediately, keep trying. Um, you'll either succeed or you'll get deflected off into another adjacent area that might be where you belong, but you've got to keep trying. And you, in my opinion, you need to be honest. You need to tell the truth. You need to face reality. And uh, hopefully I transmitted some of that mm -hmm. uh, through these stories. At the beginning, I said, everything in here is true except for a, a little bit of uh, uh, author, oh, what do you call it? Exaggeration? No, it's not that. You know, you, you emb embellishment, that's the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. As an author, you're entitled to a little bit of embellishment, but you better be telling the truth. Yes, so. indeed. Yes, indeed. Larry, and I have to tell you, I've been um, uh, looking forward to this conversation for a while. And so I've been obviously, I'm a student doing a little research and I found this quote that I just think summarizes um, your life's work. Um, the earth has music for those who will listen. And oh, I, I think that. that you have been listening to the earth for such a long time, sir. Yes, I have. <laughs> I like that quote. I'm glad. I'm so glad. I'll have to send it to you. Um, now, I did find a very funny one, which I think you will appreciate. There is no Wi-Fi in the forest, but you will find a better connection. <laughs>